Thank you very much. Um, many thanks for the invitation. Um, just uh, in order to understand whether I, uh, I write or not, I should speak 10 minutes, then Martin 10, then uh, who knows? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll wave when you have Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, New York Times is pure propaganda. Who told this? Uh, who said uh, this uh, uh, New York Times is pure propaganda? Maybe you can uh, think it was uh, uh, your president, uh, but it's Noam Chomsky in May 20, 2015. And uh, 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 the fake news media fair is not my enemy, it is the enemy of American people. This is not uh, Noam Chomsky, I suppose you can understand because of, of the style, and is your president, in fact. Um, uh, this uh, could seem to be a bad joke because uh, uh, um, new, um, Chomsky and uh, uh, Trump have the same enemy so that uh, they are the same person or they have the same ideology, which is not the case. There is a real difference between Chomsky and uh, uh, Trump for several reasons, but one is the fact that uh, he has an idea, he, he was saying that uh, no New York Times propaganda because it was an intellect, is an intellectual uh, modernist thinker, and he says that uh, on the basis of enlightenment, that the intellectual has a privileged relation to truth, that uh, on the basis of idealism, he believed that the intellectual, uh, this, the, 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 the science is something which has no practical purposes so that is uh, pure, and uh, at least if we we follow the description of the idea of modernity in, given by Lyotard in 1979 uh, is, in a sense, is a Marxist because he tried to make the unification between uh, idealism and enlightenment. So there is uh, no real relation to, uh, 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 to, to Trump. There is a, a real dif distinction between between two sentences that seems to be the same. Now we have another great intellectual, which is not a modernist, but a postmodern, and this is Richard Rorty. Richard Rorty was uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, American philosophers of last century, as you all know, and in 1979, he wrote a marvelous book, uh, whose title is Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, in which, uh, uh, that for me at least, is the best synthesis of postmodernism, postmodern philosophy, even though he never mentioned the term postmodern in this book. But it's not just a question of, of names. And the, the three basic ideas he was following was first the ironization. So you don't have to have, a, you do, should not have an, a dogmatic attitude to, towards what you say. You should be always in a kind of reflective distance toward what you are saying. Uh, this in order to avoid the dogmatism. By the way, seemingly uh, the, uh, uh, the parents of uh, uh, Rorty were too Trotskyist, and maybe there is uh, uh, an Oedipian attitude in this uh, uh, quest for uh, ironization. Then uh, the second point uh, is uh, the desublimation. This is a, a long history that uh, uh, recalls from, uh, say, at least from Nietzsche, the idea that uh, since uh, reason is uh, something uh, dogmatic and uh, uh, related to power, then the liberation could not come from reason, but uh, from the other of reason, say, for instance, the desire, uh, the fantasy, the myth, or to, uh, whatever you want. And third, the deobjectivation, the, the main thesis of uh, um, Rorty was that uh, um, objectivity is uh, uh, an obsession for uh, uh, 
Western intellectual, what is most important is solidarity. There is, should be a prevailing of solidarity over objectivity and uh, of uh, democracy over philosophy, which in a sense is, is, is right. In a sense. Imagine, that this was already in a sense the idea of John Dewey, but uh, it does match with a counter example. For instance, mafia is an excellent example of the prevailing of uh, solidarity over objectivity. But, uh, the, uh, you know, Plato tried to apply its own idea in real politics and did not su succeed. Um, Rorty did not try, and the postmodern in general, did not try to apply their ideas uh, to politics. They uh, wanted this in order to create, in a sense, a counter politics against the dominant uh, objectivity activity and uh, 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 physics, ah, oh, <laughs> you know that the reality acts uh, in uh, every moment uh, and uh, uh, you, you missed all I said, uh, so, no, it's not important but uh, just in order to understand uh, what happens uh, after. Um, well, uh, what happened to the postmodern is uh, that uh, involuntarily they succeed because uh, already this uh, example of uh, Italian po populism is uh, the practical realization 20 years later of uh, the idea of uh, postmodernity, a perverse realization because they did not want to realize this, but this uh, uh, kind of realization remains in the range of possibilities of uh, 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 of, uh, well, of postmodern, in a sense, uh, as a post truth. And uh, post truism or post structuralism uh, is uh, a continuation of, uh, of uh, this mood, for instance, uh, with the systematic uh, uh, contravention of uh, uh, contradiction of uh, the rule of uh, clear expression as presented by the British philosopher Grice uh, 40 years ago. Uh, the rule of quantity, uh, uh, don't uh, use too many uh, words in order uh, when you speak, and then uh, he has a bullshit uh, quality, be truthful, uh, and uh, it applies lie, uh, relation, uh, uh, your discourse should be pertinent uh, to the topic you are speaking about, uh, yes, the hoax, uh, and then mod modality is uh, a fashionable nonsense, which was already, uh, 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 in a sense, uh, uh, post, uh, uh, post structuralism and not a post structuralist uh, way uh, of, uh, uh, of speaking. Um, well, the question is, uh, who is responsible for? Uh, the postmodernist? Obviously not. Uh, for uh, many reasons. Uh, the one is uh, that usually uh, philosophy is uh, a superstructure and not structure, so that it cannot uh, act. Uh, <laughs> He cannot act <laughs> uh, in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in this way. And, and secondly, because they wanted something really different, and in any case, uh, I uh, doubt that, uh, for instance, uh, either uh, Berlusconi or Trump read the philosophy in the mirror of nature. Uh, um, but uh, uh, so who else? What else? Uh, the usual uh, answer is uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, uh, most of people, when uh, speak about uh, what happens now, is uh, that the extreme uh, uh, realization of uh, capitalism. I'm not really sure of this because, look, for instance, this is a representation of capital I found on the uh, internet. Uh, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this is capitalism. This is not capitalism. This is our documents, uh, politics uh, and uh, stock exchange, uh, uh, money. The capital capitalism is there. So that uh, uh, what happens uh, has few to do with uh, happens uh, in uh, uh, down uh, uh, of, of this image. So. 
capital in this case is the effect, not, is, not the cause. Of course, there are uh, capitalistic effects from uh, what happens uh, in the sense that who has money, uh, tendentially has much more money than he had, but, but uh, it's an effect. He does not plan to say, well, I will invent, uh, uh, for instance, uh, even I'm not even sure that who invented Facebook uh, uh, imagined I will do a lot of money. Maybe I will do some money. I have no other work and I will find some way for survival. He survived very well. But uh, uh, is the effect of what? I would suggest, uh, for pure obsession, that is the effect of documentality. I mean, documentality always exists. The society is grounded on documentality because the rule that creates a social object, like, for instance, a conference like this one, or holidays, or uh, debts, or uh, wars, or whatever you want, is uh, this uh, uh, rule. Object is a record the act, uh, the social object is uh, an act, something involving at least two persons, which is recorded, is very important that is recorded because uh, imagine a marriage among, between people who are without any kind of memory. The day after exists the marriage, I don't know, imagine an amnesic stock exchange. Uh, I can imagine if uh, there was a, a, a case of amnesia, some uh, blocks uh, down uh, uh, in this direction, go, go south this direction, you find the, the Wall Street, and then you will uh, destroy any kind of trace, any kind of record, any any kind of memory in the brains of people, then uh, the stock exchange will disappear because it's made by, uh, up by memory. So, um, what happens now? Uh, and this is uh, the reason of, uh, uh, of post-truth, of this increasingly high post-truth. Since the uh, ground of society is uh, uh, the existence of document, now we have an inflation of document because devices like this uh, are gigantic uh, containers of documents that uh, receive documents, produce uh, documents, and at the same time archive and broadcasters of document, and uh, as a result, you have uh, this uh, 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 increasing quantity of, uh, of document. We have already other examples in the history, but uh, for instance, this is typical, could it be interesting? It's a book uh, written 15 years ago by an historian of right, A Crisis of Truth, that shows a kind of post-truth situation in medieval England in the moment in which they were uh, passing from uh, uh, the personal truth and the objectivity of uh, document grounded on uh, paper and, uh, and so on. There was a kind of a crisis because if you are not used to do with the paper, then uh, you have a, a kind of mistrust uh, towards uh, the, the document. So this is uh, uh, a previous example, but the web is a gigantic construction of document. In the sense, the web is not what we usually think it is. Uh, it's primary recording and not just communication. What is important in the web is the fact that everything is recorded, and not just the fact that uh, you can receive uh, some form of communication. It's primary action, not just information. What we do with the web web is uh, to move something, for instance, or uh, uh, fingers. Uh, the web is primary performance, not just uh, transmission, in the sense that in the web you can produce a uh, social object, whereas while you, uh, you are watching the TV, you are not producing some social object. Uh, web is primary real, not just virtual. Uh, uh, the, 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 the real reality right now is uh, the web. 
and uh, its emergence and no mere construction. It's, I understand that I go too fast, but otherwise they will kill me. So uh, I have no other, um, in the sense that there is not a project for the web. There's not someone who decided, well, we'll create the web, which will be the gigantic. Someone projected the web and there was a kind of uh, academy between uh, uh, scholars uh, uh, that brings paper on scientific topics. But what happened now, the, uh, the web we know right now has nothing to do with the project. And uh, it's primarily opaque and not merely transparent. And this uh, creates a powerful analogy between uh, web, post-truth, and what we, with a kind of old name, which to my eyes is no more adequate to the reality, is uh, uh, the, um, the capital. Uh, well, and there's primar primarily mobilization, not just emancipation, because uh, you, you remember, for instance, the experience of uh, uh, the Arab Springs. And people say the web is emancipating. In fact, it can emancipate, but the real uh, action produced by the web is the mobilization, the fact that you act on the basis of the web, also for, you know, on personal ground. I had the, this idea of mobilization in the moment in which I wake up in the night between Friday and Saturday, look to the cell phone in order to know what time is it, I see there is a message, I read the message, I answer the message, I am working during the night between Friday and Saturday. And this is a power of mobilization that no other medium has. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, slide, the last, last one. Uh, so what put uh, instead of uh, 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 the capital as the responsible of this? I would suggest something like, that we can call documediality in the sense which uh, is um, the mixture between the power of documentality that already existed inside the society and the explosion of document and the possibility of broadcasting document, which is the possibility every one of us has right now. Uh, so, uh, in order to come back to post-truth, fact-checking and reputation are not the problem. It's important to do fact-checking, but uh, uh, the original experience showed by post-truth is not simply people lying, but is the inflation of document that allows the possibility of lying or of saying truth, and not that most of the, say, post-truther are saying we are saying the truth and you are false. So uh, uh, there are not sophisticated people who say, so, well, I will uh, tell you a story. No, no, I will tell you the truth. Uh, so uh, the, prob the problem is those, uh, the documentality, uh, documentality we still not understand. We are still not aware of the power of uh, this uh, uh, gigantic structure, which is the web. Still not aware, of course. Here, the most of people is aware because it's uh, that in society. And uh, but uh, the most of people uh, uh, working uh, uh, or um, having to do with uh, post truth are, are not aware. And uh, in this sense, we need uh, a practical reason for the web. Many thanks. Bye. Bye. No. I say in faith. Okay, so I, um, I did have, you know, a neat little PowerPoint, but I think what I'm going to do is use this opportunity to respond to Maurizio's work, to see to what extent the paradigm he lays out for us, more or less, if I can call it a paradigm, uh, in his manifesto to new realism is uh, useful and what are the limits um, of that paradigm. So in, rather than simply another story in a parallel universe, um, I'm going to try and gauge. But um, briefly, I'll leave this up here, uh, because for me, the question concerning the question is also what I think is suggested suggested by what you're working with is like the sort of creation ex nihilo of questions which then produce documents, which then produce objects to which one then has to respond in friction or something, right? And so here um, the question concerning the question is if you type A-R-E, you know, spacebar, W-O-M, 
it'll fill the, you know, it'll auto-suggest that you might be thinking about women, and then it'll fold out, you know, probabilities along various clustering algorithms, what it thinks you might be thinking, and it offers up that women might be evil, are women evil, that's the first of them. You click on that, and nine out of ten articles indeed say that women are evil, and that seems some weird parallel universe, and something that you may never have been able to tap into, partly because you're locked into the wrong, what I call, idiolect, right? Your body habits, your ways of thinking, don't think in terms of being or, you know, the R-A-R-E, like being of something, women clustering an entire, what, gender into a single kind of characteristic, impossible to think in a post-structuralist, you know, what have you, and so one ends up not asking this question, the same happens when you do something like, you know, are Jews or something, and next thing you get, you know, vermin-like uh, appearances of all sorts of suggestible links, um, and again, something impossible, partly because one is unsubscribed to that mode of typing. The body habit, in some sense, is not able to produce that fact. So it's not some Nazi cabal in A-chan or 4-chan or some Arab Tor region or some mesh network. It's actually right there on the surface, right, that you can access worlds through thinking modes or typing modes or, you know, ways of phrasing questions. So the question concerning the question is, in some sense, um, central, and I'm going to just, you know, jump right back to this one, which is what I call fantasies of genocide, if you type in, you know, uh, what uh, causes H-O-M, and I should have said W-H-A-T slash bar, because I mean the machines are not thinking in that sense, they are deeply stupid but know everything, uh, it will auto-suggest for you that you might be thinking about homosexuality and then it will sort of, uh, you know, all you need is the H-O-M and then it will tell you in this box, which is meant to be in some ways um, irrefutable, something from the first one, which is that, you know, homosexuality is caused by uh, DNA whatever, okay? Uh, which is, what's interesting about that is that um, I'm trying to suggest that, you know, the DNA argument for some people in this country is like, well, that's great, you know, it wasn't a choice. Um, as if putting too much sugar in your child's juice, being the version of uh, uh, causing homosexuality, was some kind of uh, uh, choice, right? So the, the impoverished nature of the debate is just staggering to behold. It's, you know, as if, you know, yeah, a dominant father or something, if that's the problem. Whatever the case might be, both the question itself, raising the question itself, harbors a fantasy of genocide and reversibility. Reverse engineering, take out that X chromosome, stop putting sugar in the juice, or what have you. So the question in some sense, like, you know, Eve biting out of the apple of the knowledge tree, should not be asked in the first place. And yet, when we go onto, you know, the algorithm, it not only suggests, it not only asks the question and gives you lots of valid answers, but actually suggests the question. Should you do it for heterosexuality? Well, then it's sort of no question, because you actually have to type out the whole word. It gives you some whole lot of other stuff, heterochronia, long before heterosexuality and so on. And when you get the answers, they actually tend to be, in some ways, more uh, balanced and related to the question of homosexuality all over again. There is no such, it doesn't exist uh, and persist on its own. Um, and so what I'm suggesting is that actually the question concerning the question is uh, at bottom what we need to be worried about and this production of facts or production of what we might call documents which we then have to reckon with as if they were natural uh, objects. And I think that's the, uh, the, that's the lesson I take from, uh, from your book. So just going over Maurizio's book again very briefly and this is terrifying to do in like what, like of six minutes, I'm pretending I have six, um, is that uh, there's a sort of, uh, this postmodern turn which linked knowledge to power um, and was had all sorts of liberatory aspirations and so on and, and so forth has, has kind of met its limit in our time, right? And so the reign of what one might call irony, you know, everything in inverted commas, you know, because to avoid dogmatism in some sense has turned also to be, uh, uh, has become also, or metamorphoses with the small tilt of logical angle into uh, putting into inverted commas reality itself. In other words, it became a kind of pan-constructionist uh, um, field of play for the humanities, which is why the humanities in some ways are in a crisis and a little bit culpable about what has emerged right now. We, we suffer in the face of the notion that facts are not theory-laden, right? We've been teaching that facts are theory-laden, selected, organized, hierarchized for decades now, at least a hundred years, and now we need to sort of backtrack from that suddenly. How come? Well, it's because the fact 
as real document versus the fact as dogmatism, this contrast between where the interpretive lies has been the false dichotomy that we've been dabbling in. So there's something d deeply difficult uh, going on there for us um, to unpack here. Um, so on the subject of de-objectification, here Maurizio points to the close proximity of postmodern thought with, you know, sort of free-reigning mysticism, such as, and you mentioned Benedict XVI, um, as using, leveraging this logic of the antinomic, as it were, character of all human knowledge, which must suggest the resolution in God. Well, let me update that for Americans. Michael Pence, right? Um, uh, he redates the origins of uh, the evolutionary story. He says, look, there's a story that came out. This bone they found in near the Johannesburg region redates the Australopithecus, whatever it is, by a whole couple of hundred thousand years. Um, evolution must be wrong. Look how relative it is. It suffers under the weight of this reinterpretation that has suddenly come into the books, right? And for, um, in that same moment, he says, you see, it's just a theory. Look how malleable it is. It's just a theory. And in that same moment, he, in an act of apparent humility, the healthy skeptic, etc., actually uh, then elevates his own, th his own fundamentalist belief to the status of a theory. This is what's fascinating. There's a double movement here. And says, look, I too just believe in a theory. It just happens to be intelligent design. So what's happened here is you demote the friction uh, full document uh, encounter down to just a theory, and you elevate a fundamentalist belief to a theory. And this rhetorical move, maneuver is, goes sort of invisible because of the way we're so rehearsed in, uh, in, in theory um, and uh, uh, the understanding that all facts are open to interpretation and so on and so forth. So um, it's, a, it's a deep uh, form of sophistry um, going on there. And fundamentalism in this particular conjuncture becomes fact, not in the sense that we now believe intelligent design, but it takes on the status of the irrefutable. It becomes the object that's unmovable, and in fact, the facts get tossed into this sort of, I don't know, uh, blender of relativism, right? It's a fascinating sort of reversal. Um, so I'm going to try to turn this into a question because, okay, so Maurizio makes a distinction between natural objects, which is, you know, cholera outbreak. You know, you can't really interpret that, okay? Then uh, we get um, social objects, and then we get ideal objects. I'm only going to deal with the first two because natural objects, I think you raise a very powerful way of leveraging, um, you know, a sense of a reality that's indifferent to quotation marking the world, right? I mean, there's a way in which it doesn't matter if you believe in cholera or not. It's going to get you, you know, or HIV or cancer or what have you. And viruses are important because I want to switch to viruses in the sense of the mathematical virus, the mathemat mathematicization um, of our thinking through objects. Um, so the question is, if you have exposed the way that natural objects seem to have taken on the character of social objects, in other words, nature itself succumbs to the dream world of, of theorizing, the question becomes, what of the case when social objects take on the character of natural ones? Social objects taking on the character of natural ones. And clearly postmodernism or pan-constructivism and so on is not really going to help us here. But you do deploy Derrida in that moment of the social. Derrida, you know, a moderated Derrida, a moderate constructionism. Not there is nothing outside the text, but there's nothing outside the social text. But then we delivered back to Derrida's paradigm as soon as we're dealing with the social. I want to in some ways challenge that too, not because I'm not Derridian, but I think this is not the place to go wholesale into Derrida, because uh, the problem of, um, of, of post-truth in big data, this is important, alternative facts, yes, but how they articulate to mathematical systems is that they, they, they first of all point to social and not natural knowledge. So solving the relation of epistemology to the natural world is of a different order. Okay, so thank you for the solution to the natural world. We've got a different problem on our hands here. Um, so the clue to the answer might be this verbamanent moment where, you know, you speak of the multiplication of social objects or the increase in realia and on your PowerPoint, I think you mentioned the inflation of documents. But what do we make of that increase? What exactly is going on there? Is realia proliferation assisting this, the false social fact? Is that what's going on? And if so, then what reigns in the fact? What brings documentality back into play. So we must also, you know, distinguish different kinds of 
faux news, like fake news, like as in like that's just you know a false birtherism or something, right? Or uh, a pizza and 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 pedophiles, or fake. But the true falsehoods are also something to be reckoned with here, which is you know in the same time that uh, Trump sort of miraculously called up Swedish rape statistics and so on, rape statistics having gone up in Sweden in that very same I think week, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and Russia you know altered the character of what rape meant in uh, in Russia giving it a much narrower definition you know hey you can beat up somebody and it's you know maybe 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 not going to count as rape whereas in Sweden it's defined broadly enough that yes the rape statistics went up okay so what you have now is a true fact but deeply deeply problematically sort of interwoven with a falsehood um, and then we do have the problem in relation to all of these fields of viral formations right viral formations online that function like cancer or cholera when uh, when a false fact becomes a new friction laden uh, document object to uh, deal with um, and here you know I'll just go quickly through um, one a uh, possible way of um of, of rendering this, which is what I call platonic objects that somehow emerge online. So, uh, you know, software technologies uh, such as MIDI, you know, I've been working with Jessica and Stefan on uh, MIDI, when that becomes sort of the dominant representation scheme for music in code or something, right, and it has a hold or a grip on the imaginative capacities for decades, um, it has a capacious stability long beyond its origin point on the piano or what have you, or beat induction technologies that are in some ways artifacts of false witness, right? They somehow interpolate the, the human subject in a way uh, that is uh, a false. And I could go into just briefly mentioning my colleague Alex Galloway, who speaks of objective-oriented programming itself as a way of, um, uh, of information hiding and obfuscation and so on and so forth, at the very same time that this combination of logic gates and variables and so on and so forth, in fact, usher in what are called classes and then get categorized into objects that then become more and more opaque and disappear um, in some ways. Um, so again, so, the, so uh, uh, these exist apart from traditional artifacts and um, are in some sense indifferent also to our volitions and cogitations. In other words, we now have social objects that behave like gravity and we must reckon with that and that is the sort of site of greater oppression. So I'll leave it at that for now. So um, thank you both so much for that explosion of wisdom. <laughs> um, and thank you also for doing it so quickly. So I'm just going to ask one question, um, and then we'll move into the audience, because I want to make sure everyone here gets a chance to participate. Um, and I'll try, I'm going to try to like do a little work of synthesizing your ideas and then sending them back at you. Um, so we've been talking about the relationship between post-structuralism, which is sort of the idea that truth is socially constructed and everyone has their own sense of reality and it's violence to not recognize that. You know, it came from an ethical and like solid political perspective and how that has been co-opted by the right and turned into this post-truth discourse. Um, so, and then uh, Mauricio has proposed that the problem is not fundamentally capitalism, pro the problem is documentality. Um, and Martin has brought up this question of the relationship between truth that is like scientific and real, like cholera, and another form of truth that is socially constructed but has to be dealt with as if it is real. Um, and that seems to be related to data and to documentality. So what I would like you guys to talk about are those two points and how you see them relating to each other. And I'm having trouble, I, I, I feel like there's something really important here that I don't fully understand about how documentality and how these forms of truth construction and like s social realities could lead to capitalism and can lead to advanced capitalism, can lead to post-truth. Um, so I'd love to hear some thoughts on that and we'll try to do it kind of quickly and so we can talk to the audience. Yes, I, I, I really answer quickly to your point and uh, to, to, to Martin's point, very, very quickly. 
for the cap capitalism. For instance, uh, there is uh, this um, economist, Hernando, Dos, uh, Hernando de Soto, who in 2002 wrote a book uh, saying that uh, um, it was why, uh, why capitalism triumphs in the West and uh, fails uh, everywhere uh, uh, outside. I don't know whether uh, it, uh, it fails or it triumphs, uh, but uh, uh, the theory was that uh, we are uh, in, uh, um, in, in Western society, we have plenty of documents that can record any kind of, uh, uh, I have my house and I have a document that shows that I have my house so that I can sell my house. If I, I don't have a document uh, certifying the, pos uh, the, 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 the property of the house, it becomes um, uh, uneasy to uh, create capital. So, and don't forget that at the very end, uh, money is a kind of document. We can say that money is the document for people who are not able to read because you can just recognize, detect the document from the color of the money. Well, but my idea is why is uh, uh, we should be so reductive uh, to think that uh, is uh, um, just the possibility of uh, capitalism instead of being of the possibility of the society, so that the real structure of the society is not this kind of uh, intentionalist structure that uh, is widespread uh, in the interpretation of society. What is society and why uh, social objects are important? Well, because we all agree that money is important and I decide that we all agree on the fact that this is uh, 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 this bill is uh, 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 as a value. Uh, we can uh, pre present uh, uh, there is a problem on the intentionality because uh, uh, society is not a place in which people agree each other, but it's a place in which people have conflict uh, usually one each other, so that it creates a, a strange idea of uh, uh, society. And um, creates also a reality that are uh, generated, constructed by own, own uh, uh, ideas, so that there is uh, uh, the cruel capitalism, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the aggressive one. I don't say that capitalism are not cruel, but uh, they have not decided to be cruel. There are plenty of other people who are cruel without being capitalist, and the real point is that the the social dynamics are mostly independent from this kind of individual attitude. Uh, I still believe that in a sense, speaking of capitalism, is to create a negative godness that does not allow us to understand what is happening. Like uh, giving a kind of intentionality. They decided to do this. And uh, saying they decided to do this, uh, we are not able to understand what is happening. This, uh, uh, we, we are uh, hidden by the real structure. For uh, uh, this time, very, very quickly, the question of, uh, of Martin. Uh, I perfectly agree with the idea of a platonic social object because, of course, no one invented uh, the traditional music. Uh, there, uh, there you cannot say who was the inventor of this. It emerged from uh, a, a, a context. We can say the same for uh, religion, politics. I cannot imagine that the Greeks decided, well, we have to create create a pantheon. We take an old man and call them uh, Zeus and then we can uh, youngest lady. Well, okay. It doesn't happen so. There is a previous existence object that are grounded also in our pre-human uh, uh, um, reality that emerge and this applies uh, to uh, the uh, to, 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 to what Martin calls a platonic object. I, uh, also, also, the language, in a sense, is a platonic object because uh, except uh, some kind of uh, artificial language, no one decided to uh, create uh, a language uh, from ex nihilo. Um, so the question of financialization. I think um, the implications of, uh, you know, um, 
innovative development and so on and so forth. And um, not capital, but financialization, modes of financialization are deeply, deeply important. So in what sense? And, but we need to proliferate, right? It's not just one thing. And so this is why I think this, this sort of rush to Marxism uh, or the Marxist analysis is just deeply insufficient. But let's just take a few examples. So I mentioned, for example, you know, MIDI or something like that. Let's take uh, the new, uh, more semantic software around, around um, uh, entrainment, such as beat trackers or something. The grant writers are advancing uh, uh, the notion that this is about neurogenetic diseases and there's a kind of disability um, sort of uh, raison d'etre at work in the grant writing. But the reality is that these, uh, these software um, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, executions, I like that word because it's sort of, you know, it's a bit like a virus. Uh, it produces something as it destroys something else. But they are deeply endowed with market value. And that's very clear. Spotify, for example, is very, very interested in beat induction technology. And it is partly bankrolling it. Google uh, is bankrolling this too, and so on. So there's a financial investment in producing this kind of platonic object. The fact that it's platonic is the sense that, you know, beat trackers are deeply sort of Euro-industrial and so on. And I can explain that, but that's not the point. Uh, the issue is how it gets financialized. So the grant, which is public-private money, might be written up as uh, something to do with uh, health and well-being, but it's clear where the destination is. And, uh, you know, the story of technology and its relationship to disabilities and how it gets caught in riptides of capital is probably uh, the most important uh, way in which we could understand technological de development. But let's take other sites. It's clear that Google or something like that is actually actively interested in, um, how should we say, free, uh, in keeping culture free. That might seem paradoxical. It was paradoxical with MIDI. You know, it was initially a free kind of app. Well, there's always something, a price to be paid. And here you, you have to think about feminine technologies and or as it were container technologies and how they are parasites for you know a monetization and how that works and here again we have a deeply paradoxical sort of way in which subjectivation processes affect and so on we had somebody speak uh, to that um, in one of our workshops uh, works right it's not the disciplining sort of old model of Foucault that we sort of comport our bodies in relation to a perceived panopticon right that we somehow get the feeling that we might be being watched the gaze and so on and so forth, which we've endless been, endlessly been thematizing. But in fact, we know we're being watched, but we behave like we're not being watched. In fact, it's the great externalization or objectification of the id itself. It's in some sense the ballooning of desire and so on, precisely because of the financial investment in rich data sets, right? So this is now a different kind of way in which this concept that emerges, in the case of beat trackers, it has a slightly different character, but these are financial financialized concepts, or one might call them um, ontologies in finance, right, or objects in finance. So I would not want to delink how it gets financialized, even when we go straight to the fake, uh, you know, Macedonian teenagers and so on and so forth. The paradox for us in the humanities is that the bias over there had very little to do with a commitment, a political commitment, but had everything to do with the way one is enjoined by the financialization apparatus. In other words, you know, AdSense is going to secrete a little bit of its capital in my direction if I make things go this way or that. Again, deeply paradoxical. Now we're talking not about erratic I, uh, uh, ballooning of the id, but the opposite. We're talking about indifference um, that in fact, but both share the quality of it. If we look at the financialization and what's going on under the hood, how does the object-oriented, you know, um, algorithm function, I think we're on to, um, uh, we're, we're on to, that triad, right, I think is an important aspect and we don't want to eliminate any of those from the analysis. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to open it up to the audience now and also please... Ask me questions if you need definitions or anything like that. Um, I think I have <laughs> okay, so we're going to open it up. Um, when you want to talk, just just wave your hand and I'll come bring you a mic. Anyone brave enough to start? Yeah. I'll start that. Thank you so much for, for this presentation that um, were 
very much resonating with the whole discussion that we had earlier, but also with a larger scope, so thank you. Um, I think I'd like to hear more about um, you, you both, uh, Martin and, and, and Mauricio, on uh, computer and mathematics and the difference between uh, computer code and mathematics as a language. Uh, in other terms, my question would be, um, digital technology are of certain, like, for the first time in history of science, uh, a sort of deep socialization and industrialization of mathematical object. And following that, um, the pragmatic nature of computer code might be a very narrow way to look at mathematics as uh, a language, or I don't know if you can answer that. Yes, and like even more so, how are we constructing truths and realities through these languages, and in what ways might they be limited? Um, and let's try not to talk too long so more people can ask you questions. Um, I would say that uh, mathematics is technology and uh, language too, and there are plenty of things that uh, are technology and we consider otherwise. But I definite by technology any kind of competence without comprehension. I mean, we are able to act in many things without having a, a, a clear concept of what we are doing. For instance, speaking a language or a first language or uh, making calculus, because uh, when uh, you are making calculus, uh, a mathematic calculus, you are using symbols without having a clear idea of what you are really doing. It's a technological attitude, and uh, this became uh, uh, very clear if you think about the abacus, in which uh, the, uh, uh, the result is given by some acts you do. Euler, the mathematician, said that uh, its uh, uh, mathematical thoughts were on the point of its pencil, which is important because imagine how could you can do mathematics without uh, some form of technical inscription. It's clearly uh, you cannot afford because, as you know, uh, we are not able to recognize uh, more uh, than five objects uh, without uh, a calculus, uh, only with the, the, the eye. So uh, uh, the realm of technology is much wider uh, than we can imagine, and that uh, we are part of technology since uh, the very origin, not something that appeared right now. And also this uh, gives uh, a good answer towards, uh, for instance, uh, a philosopher like Kant believed that in order to act, we need uh, to have concept. In order to recognize this table, I need uh, to have the concept of substance as uh, something permanent uh, in uh, the time, and then, oh, I recognize uh, the table. Uh, um, which is uh, because they are, uh, this idea that uh, here you have uh, the ontology, what there is, the, here you have the epistemology, what uh, we know about what there is, the concept, and uh, uh, you, so you need, uh, since you are living in the real world, so in, the, in the ontology, you need uh, the epistemology, the concept. Sometimes you need uh, the epistemology, but uh, usually you have the technology with uh, this intermediate between uh, uh, what we know and what there is. And the most we do in uh, our life uh, is technology, competence without comprehension. Who uses uh, uh, even simply an elevator or has a clear concept of an elevator? And we need uh, a lift. Uh, we need uh, to have a clear concept of the lift in order to have a lift, uh, use a lift, I don't believe. Yeah, it's funny. I think if um, if things had been able to be elaborated a little bit further, uh, this would have been the crux of the question, actually, uh, that I wanted to leverage, which is, um, you know, if there is nothing uh, social outside the text, what kind of social text is mathematics, right? So that becomes the question. What kind of social text, what kind of object is this? And I think it's, again, um, quite important because we've been dealing with things at what you know Alex Galloway would call like the screen layer like you know here's this false 
belief and so on and so forth, and we scalp things, and I have images up here that demonstrate this. But what we don't do is look so much at the sorting mechanisms, like under the hood, that are, that are, that are working this out. And um, what I want to suggest for the humanities, again, the big, one of the big reconstructions is not only that, uh, that, that we need to rethink about how facts um, are not uh, only theory laden, but something else, um, uh, but also the uh, neutrality stance. And I want to suggest as a provisional sort of maneuver that the algorithms are more or less a little bit neutral and not in fact these hierarchized um, uh, zones in the same way that the screen layer is hierarchized. Okay? And this is, this is this important just disjunct or discontinuity between the one layer and then the layer of you know, code or sorting mechanisms. Uh, whether it's a connecting model, a centroid model, K clustering, whatever that might be, all of those are in some sense biased, but it's not because there's white male cyber cowboys or whatever. They are biased for reasons that have to do with the way they cluster things. And that that is in some sense um, different to the actual results that the user is perceiving, right? So there's a sort of what I call an asynchrony or a heteromorphology or something. There's a heteromorphological uh, relationship between the one layer and the other. It's bias, as it were, the mathematical bias, if you like. And I mean, Alex has been trying to work this out, Alex Galloway has been trying to work this out by like, you know, saying that, uh, uh, so if you, you, by deploying Badieu and working with numerosity systems and so on that are a disjunct at some level and the, uh, the subject enters at that level of disjuncture. Uh, perhaps that's the way to go. I think uh, a simpler thing would just be to register this heteromorphic, um, uh, uh, heteromorphology, um, again, that the, the bias of the algorithm is of a different sort to the bias projected on the screen layer, um, and that therefore these it's in a transverse relationship to the two. So now you have two things to deal with um, when you're trying to unpack how that false news can travel within a kind of digital architecture. Um, there's different kinds of mathematics for like the beat trackers and stuff, but I, you know, I don't want to take up time, but that would be one way of answering that question as it pertains to this, what's up on the screen and so on. Beat trackers have a different kind of algorithm that has to do with modeling human perception, which is another kind of a problem, uh, maybe more Cambridge Analytica type problem, but you know, that requires a different gaze into how the mechanics of the algorithm work and not one that rushes to the answer that everything is theory laden but uh, doesn't relinquish it at the same time. Hi, um, I'm Kathy O'Neill, mathematician, someone who thinks about algorithms all the time and I have to be completely honest with you, I have no idea what you guys are talking about and I'm, I'm very, very confused. I'm wondering if um, one of you could just simple language, try that again. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, okay. So, a cluster, the simple point is the way a clustering mechanism works or a clustering algorithm works is not in the, I'm trying to suggest that it's not biased in the same way that a piece of fake news is biased. Even if the clustering brought and transmitted a certain viewpoint from one place to another that there's different modes of selection, hierarchizing, organizing it. They, they, differently, they differently articulate to the problem of bias. Okay. Can I just comment that, I mean, as a mathematician and as a data scientist, I could inject bias into a graph to, to, to make it much closer to the kind of bias you're talking about that I could also write a fake news article about, right? Because you can lie with statistics. So I don't know if, I, I don't know, maybe I don't, but I still don't quite understand. Yes, yes, I mean, absolutely. So, so, but they don't always exist in that, uh, they don't always exist in that symbiotic relationship, okay? So not all statistics are gonna function equally. So uh, it is now alarming to Facebook and Google that we, uh, that they were vehicles for fake news. And so now we have little banners warning you and so on and so forth. It is, it was not in some sense scripted into the way that clustering algorithm was designed, right? It, it, it in some sense produced, how should we say, technoly, technologically determinist, you know, unanticipated effects. And so they're not of the same sort is, is all that I'm trying to say. I'm trying to separate the layer of, 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 of an analy an analyzing the modality of uh, um, a, an algorithmic working versus the modality of a fact and its relationship to truth. 
Um, I'll ask a question actually related to that. Because in a sense, like that brings up how Facebook changes its algorithm brings up some really interesting questions for this. So Facebook decided um, not this last year, but the year before, to start prioritizing news content. And this was in part driven by capital. They created some relationships with publishers to host content directly on their site on the Instant Articles platform. And they created basically a revenue sharing model between publishers and themselves. Um, they then suddenly switched this in June of 2016 to reprioritize friends and family because I don't know whether or not they were getting complaints from users that they saw too much news content on their feed or whether or not it was because of internal decisions made within the organization, but for whichever reason, it was no longer in line with whatever Facebook's objectives or goals were to prioritize content coming from news media, so they instead decided to prioritize content from friends and family. This corresponded with an uptick in the spread of fake news. So often, and I mean this is fully embedded within conversations about capital, um, we can point to certain decisions that are made um, in the design of an algorithm that can have far-reaching effects for how truth or falsity is constructed, spread, and whatnot. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. I'm also wondering as well about this disconnect that you guys are both positing between capital and the production of truth, particularly when documentality now is so intrinsic towards capital. So if, you know, news media production and just truth production for individuals or networks online um, is bolstered by an ad model that require that rests on things like clicks and views that in a part does construct the kind of ecosystem um, where you know it's possible for these two sets of alternative realities to exist simultaneously. So capital does become embedded within the documentality that is feeding this infrastructure. Thank you. If I can, uh, just uh, just to point, and then then Martin, uh, for uh, uh, the the point um, of uh, of the algorithm, it's interesting because there is a, 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 I don't know anything about algorithms, but I suppose that they create regularities. And this is a problem for truth, because truth is, uh, uh, in many cases, is not regular, it's surprising. It doesn't accomplish what we expect to. So that if you have a, an algorithm-based uh, uh, truth, then you will have a, a huge quantity of uh, uh, um, uh, of quasi truth or look like truth because uh, is uh, uh, as an analogy with many other things happening so um, uh, um, the, the, the old principle that uh, is not uh, new that uh, a dog uh, uh, hurt a man, but uh, when a man uh, uh, hurt a, a dog is a new because uh, it's not uh, so, so, so common. Uh, the algorithm cannot uh, uh, keep this, this kind of singularity. Uh, the second point for the capitalism, uh, you can say, well, uh, you can call a capitalism of the click and of uh, uh, the I like uh, in uh, uh, Facebook, for instance. But what, why call this capitalism? Because uh, uh, the goal of uh, this click and like, and the reason why people want to have this click and dislike, usually is not money, but is to be recognized. That is a point that has been raised by, uh, uh, by Martin during our discussion. I won't say that is uh, sane or insane, this need of being recognized, but is something that is different from the reason why people were working in uh, uh, capitalist uh, epoch. 
Uh, 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 we'll say, uh, this is very important. If you want to understand what happens, we should do, uh, have, of course, also different categories, which are, which are not new at all. Uh, plenty of philosophers, Hegel wrote uh, 100 pages on the problem of being recognized. But uh, uh, it was, uh, in a sense, less important at uh, its epoch in which people have to survive much more than to be recognized. Who, who, who looks for, uh, I like, want to be recognized? Yeah, I think so. The question is about uh, financialization. And I uh, think I emphasized uh, deeply how these ontologies are ontologies in finance. And so the imbrication of the one with the other in various um, environments. And it functions differently for different you know, platforms, apps, and so on and so forth. Um, so that, I think, is, is, uh, is crucial. So I can only, uh, only agree. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to um, suggest is that, the, that we keep analytic layers provisionally apart before we bring them together again, in the sense that if one looks at the way the financialization mechanisms work, um, distinctly from the effects they have on the social layer, on the audiovisual screen, which is you know just waiting to be touched like skin and so on and so forth, and then third, how it functions as a mathematical object. What I'm suggesting is not that either of any of these, or that the mathematical object is in some sense um, not biased, but that its bias is of a, is in a transversal relation to the bias that manage, it manages to um, secrete, in a sense, as a conduit or something. So it's just important to keep these layers, I think, apart uh, before we, so that one may join them with more precision, precision again. So it's not, uh, again, back to the other point at all to do with algorithms being non-biased as such, but that their bias is of a different sort to the bias that they manage to freight. Yeah. I'm actually wondering now that I'm listening to this if there's a maybe a connection here. So you both seem to agree that you know algorithms are capable of having a bias, and you also both agree that we're in this moment of post-truth. And Mauricio has suggested that these moments arise historically when we basically like lose track of the lower layer biases, right? When we're unable to look at the dissemination technologies, the communication technologies and understand how they're operating and then they become sort of mystified to us, right? And religion rises and uh, truth sort of becomes less accessible. And so I'm wondering, and so then Martin's saying that this layer um, of the technology at which post-truth is like disse being disseminated and uh, sort of flourishing right now is a layer at which we can't really see the algorithmic bias, right? That is that is not transparent to us anymore. So I wonder if there's something going on there where we can bring your thoughts together with what Cassidy was saying about like the deeper the deeper biases that just are not obvious to us right now. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the, th what I'm reckoning with right now is this idea that Facebook or, you know, whatever content we create that is a social text that other people can comment on and take up and interpretate, interpret. But I don't know, when you talk about the lack of, or the, the different bias in algorithms, if algorithms or um, coding communities are social texts where you create a language, each language has a community, different people can add or contribute to that language. Um, isn't that already, isn't there a severe limitation on, on the sort of people who are participating in that, that social taking up of, of, a, of a code or algorithm creation, right? So we're, we're really not, um, I don't know how many people are involved with the task of creating those classifications, like for an algorithm. Um, and if that in and of itself, um, again, to, uh, trying to, to limit it to the conversation of the bias that you're talking about. Um, does that make sense? You have, you have an answer, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, I don't know, but I hope, because I don't. 
Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I fully. Um, I fully uh, get the question. But on the on the subject of uh, Facebook and fake news, like you know, Facebook is now like, did Facebook win the election for Trump and so on and so forth? Like that question, um, I might have uh, you know a, a small reflection on. And you know, a, a company like uh, Cambridge Analytica and the way it combines maybe a certain kind of um, psychometric logic uh, around uh, uh, what human beings are uh, versus um, Another kind of logic, which is the feed itself, um, again, and the imbrication of capital at all times, but I'll suspend that uh, focus just for a second, which is, um, you know, so, uh, so the way Cambridge Analytica more or less functions, and again, the humanities would come in and deconstruct this all and say nobody's like, you know, part of the ocean method, like O-C-E-A-N, which means, you know, characteristics, types, uh, personality types. So not just gender, sex, uh, sexuality, and race that can be guessed by the machine, but, uh, but further details of your affective profile, such as are you open-minded, the O in ocean, are you open-minded or closed-minded, C, are you conscientious or not, E, are you extroverted or introverted, and so on, or N, are you neurotic? And then you, uh, the difference with political um, uh, profiling like this and just you know, standard delivery systems to or recommendation systems on Amazon is that what you need to do is not just get people to buy whatever they want, wherever the niche is, but rather they need to buy the same product, they need to buy the same president. So we need to make a difference here, a distinction here between like sheer economics and political uh, delivery systems. You still need to buy the same guy, or you know, in this case, case, um, uh, guy or girl. Um, and so, um, so, so, so what do you do? How do you get people to, uh, do, to do that? Well, you know, Cambridge Analytica sort of profiles you down to, you know, your uh, characteristics and uh, uh, emotional characteristics. And then, you know, if you are gendered male or, or gendered female, gendered neurotic, I mean, or, or profiled as neurotic and, and very conscientious, you know, you will get an ad that has got hues of blue um, with thematics coming out of um, horror movies and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, a sound, an acousmatic sound perhaps appearing and then you know uh, you wake up uh, the next morning and the quick calculation I've got five minutes for 911 to come but if I had that gun I wouldn't you know I'd be able to sa save myself in five seconds I didn't want that gun but here it is anyway uh, and don't let Hillary take your gun if it's now gendered male and not neurotic but uh, you know uh, empathetic and uh, uh, child loving and so on and so forth you now set up the same ad how do you deliver them to the second amendment you know hues of orange a different sonic gift Wrap full of you know orchestral uh, strings and so on, and then um, you add a, 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 a sort of pro, uh, um, a profile image of somebody walking into a sunset with a gun loosely strung. This time a big gun, right? And a son, uh, you know, clearly a boy, a little boy, like following. Don't let Harry Clinton like destroy your family life and so on. This is you know a very different way of getting the same target through d deeply different um, uh, affective profiling, if you like. Um, and where the humanities uh, would have come in in the past would be like those psychometrics are, are deeply sort of atemporal. They sort of project atemporal bodies that are it disembodies in a way. Um, and yet it seems to have had uh, done its work. And here, again, to reverse the problem of postmodernism and humanities, maybe we need to start thinking identity more. Yes, gender is a performance and so on. But, uh, you know, the profiling of the... Um, uh, uh, gender and so on through this ocean method is 86% accurate. So we've got to think identity as well as just performance, not just the dream work of performance, but also the narrowing, awful work of ontological identity. We have just uh, uh, something very uh, quick to add uh, on the point um, in order to illustrate how uh, increasing documentality can create a problem uh, in uh, the field of post-truth, uh, create post-truth. Because if uh, we have, uh, uh, we uh, lived for uh, so much time in a uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, rarity of document. A document were things like uh, these books uh, or the newspapers uh, and uh, uh, also I mean, uh, we are uh, very well biased, uh, very well equipped in order to recognize uh, biases uh, in, uh, say, uh, uh, direct interaction, interaction, because I can see someone look me with uh, uh, hate, uh, and I can imagine that is biased, and I 
put uh, into a frame what he will say to me. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something to have a theory of mind of other minds is uh, uh, natural equipment of, uh, of humans. We are also culturally uh, equipped in order to understand that maybe what uh, the Pravda say, writes and what uh, the New York Times write on the same topic are uh, somehow biased. But uh, we are not equipped in order to imagine that everything we read in the web is biased because there is too much and uh, we have uh, no, uh, no kind of, uh, of previous knowledge on this. Um, I think that's a great place to wrap this up because we are running out of time. Um, I really want to thank our speakers and if everybody could help thank them with me.